Okay, my name is Philip Stevens. I'm a, a, a columnist on the Financial Times. Uh, I'd like to thank the ECFR for inviting me to what promises to be a couple of days of fascinating uh, conversation. Our subject for the next hour is um, can Europe defend itself? Uh, I think I might add to that, will Europe uh, defend itself? I'm sure we can. I think the question is perhaps whether we will. Um, I have an old friend who works in the State Department in Washington. He's just about to, to leave and he's been there, uh, as he puts it, since the uh, days when people thought the Soviet Union was going to last forever. Uh, and he now has a little post-it note on his, uh, his desktop computer uh, and it just says there are no rules. And he's got it there, he says, to remind himself that all the assumptions that he grew up with as a diplomat in the Cold War and then in the post-Cold War order no longer apply with the present administration. The assumptions about America's interests, the range of its power, uh, the condition of its alliances, uh, the nature and choice sometimes of adversaries. And I think it's something that perhaps we Europeans uh, should think about too, that most of the assumptions certainly uh, that I grew up with and that we had during the sort of post-Cold War order uh, are now going. And one of those assumptions is that we could rely on the United States to defend us more or less forever. Um, I don't think, uh, and I'm sure uh, we'll hear from NATO, I don't think uh, NATO is going to collapse uh, overnight or next year or the year after or the year after that. But I think the assumption that uh, Donald Trump is a complete aberration and that will he, will he will be succeeded, replaced by someone who will simply restore uh, the old uh, security order uh, is badly mistaken. If uh, Europe will have to and should uh, do more to defend itself. Uh, we live in a rough neighborhood that's getting rougher. The security challenges from, not just hard security challenges from uh, Russia, but uh, more diverse ones from uncontrolled migration, uh, from disease, uh, and of course from uh, terrorism are multiplying and they tend to be in our neighborhood. So we have um, four great speakers to address uh, these issues. I'm going to uh, ask them all uh, to speak individually just for a few minutes because at the end of uh, now 50 minutes we're going to have the uh, French Armed Forces Minister, uh, Florence Parly, uh, speak to us about France's new uh, European Intervention Initiative. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Denis Messier and to ask him about uh, who is uh, head of uh, uh, transformation at NATO. I'm not sure how many transformations there have been at NATO in the last <laughs> 20 years. Um, More but, than you <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the latest transformation, and actually one of the, the counterintuitive things is even though uh, the, present, the President of the United States has been rather disparaging at times about NATO, actually NATO has been doing things on its eastern flank in a way that uh, uh, some of us might not have expected. But one of the questions we have to answer in this session is one, do we have the political will to defend ourselves? And two, how are we going to organize that between NATO, between the European Union, and between initiatives uh, such as Mr. Macron's, uh, the European uh, Intervention Initiative? So can we organize ourselves in a coherent way if we have the political will? But um, perhaps uh, uh, Denis Messier will uh, give us a, a sort of few minutes on uh, uh, What's NATO doing and how, how it's shaping up? Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, 
Yeah, NATO has been uh, has, has been doing uh, over the past years uh, more in regarding transformation or adaptation or whatever we call it. Uh, 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 probably more than any other international organization. But just to answer your question, uh, a quick thing about uh, the environment, because we are talking about the uh, world uh, disorder. And uh, uh, I, I'm used to saying in my conferences and uh, in my lectures that uh, we have shifted from uh, complicated to complex world. Complicated was a world where uh, we could uh, uh, continue to draw reasonable conclusions regarding the uh, signs uh, of crisis and uh, we could make uh, decision making uh, with, uh, with parameters uh, that would lead us to, be, uh, to have some kind of confidence in the result uh, of the decisions we have made. A complex world is totally different and this is the world we are facing today. And uh, the maintenance of this complexity uh, go with the interrelation of crisis, interrelation of threats, the emergence of new war fighting domains such as cyber, information environment, and the access to technology. And, uh, and we have so many parameters today that we know that uh, our decision making in, uh, uh, will be always imperfect and uh, we will always be surprised. If we think we will not be surprised, we are wrong. And, uh, and then we need to be resilient. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, really consequences of this complexity is that, uh, and that's the same for the uh, successful civilian companies, that there is no one organization no uh, one country uh, today that has all the keys of the success, especially when we deal with crisis. And this is something we have to, uh, to keep in mind. And this is, uh, some, this is why NATO is uh, uh, dedicating a huge uh, amount of resources in the development of partnerships. And when I'm talking about partnerships, I'm not talking only about nations, but partnership with the other international organizations. And the uh, NATO-EU relation lies with this, uh, with this complexity and this necessity uh, to, uh, uh, to partner together. And uh, uh, just, I would like to make a, a clear statement here, and uh, that's uh, when, I, when I go to many European countries, and France is one of them, uh, the, uh, uh, the understanding of NATO is that uh, it is a pretty much a uh, US-led organization. When I go to Washington, there are very few people who know even what NATO stands for, and for them, this is very much a European organization. And that's a, that, that's, that's a difference of perception that we need to understand. And regarding uh, uh, NATO-EU cooperation, I will, I will just give uh, 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 some, some headlines of the, uh, of the many areas where we could develop that, especially uh, with the consequences for the European countries. But one of them is, since the Warsaw Summit, since the crisis in Ukraine, NATO is both focusing a lot on, uh, price, on, um, on uh, collective defense. The, uh, the three court has collective defense crisis management cooperative security that are laid out in the strategic concept for NATO uh, issued in 2010 are still valid, but there is a strong focus today on collective defense. What does that mean? That means that, for instance, in the adaptation we are conducting, the deployability of the NATO headquarters or the NATO command structure is, uh, is no longer an issue. And what, what we are planning for is to have a more resilient command and control structure that is not deployable any longer. What does that mean? That means that who is going to provide the uh, deployable headquarters in case we have to conduct you know, non-Article 5 crisis management operation? Nations. And uh, we are asking nations, we NATO, we are asking nations to provide the deployable capacities. Which, which, which means that, and, and we are asking nations to train them and to take their part of this training, to train non-Article 5, has a, have a, a, a much bigger uh, involvement in this training of deployable, deployable headquarters and non-Article 5 missions, which offers a huge opportunity for NATO-EU cooperation. NATO refocusing on collective defense and, uh, and, and the European Union organizing this uh, uh, crisis management uh, uh, exercises, preparation, in order to be sure that we have a, a good complementarity between the two organizations. And this is, we, we never had, uh, we have never had this, uh, this uh, huge opportunity in, in the past years. And this is something we should not miss for, uh, for me. And especially we should uh, start to look at uh, uh, common mechanism, cooperation mechanism, especially uh, with, the, uh, with the M2 share license learned. Um, a few other areas uh, very quickly. Cyber, cyber is uh, 
uh, is a domain that, uh, uh, that is a priority for both organizations. We need to be uh, uh, much uh, uh, better coordinated uh, when we look at uh, the uh, interdependency of the vulnerabilities. And uh, we have already started developing best uh, practices, exchange of practices and code of conduct and cooperation between NATO and EU. But this is really an area where we, where we we, uh, we could continue to uh, strengthen our partnership with this uh, idea of uh, ensuring a better complementarity. Information environment. Information environment. You know, the early sign of crisis uh, will, uh, uh, we, if we, if we provided that we are able to detect them, could be found everywhere in the world. And this is why we uh, are, are uh, uh, strongly supported the idea that uh, even if NATO is a Euro Atlantic organization, uh, we need to have a global awareness. And the only sign of crisis uh, that, and, and the trends that would lead to a crisis, uh, most of them would be found in, in the public, uh, public environment and uh, in the open source. And we are developing NATO now tools in order to be able to do data mining and, and see how data science could help us capture, capture these signs. And the value of it is, because we are talking about open source, publicly available information, we can share information without asking the, uh, the allies and the member states. And that, uh, that, that offers really, really a much better uh, capacity uh, to, share, uh, to share information, especially uh, with the aim to detect uh, what could be a crisis in the future. Um, yeah, innovation. Uh, we have uh, many technologies that will have a huge influence on the way we conduct operations. And, uh, and uh, we, it's, there is a necessity for me to, 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 to share this. Uh, and the consequences regarding the threats and the opportunities with the use of these technologies, I'm thinking about artificial intelligence, many others, between NATO and EU. Mobility, there is, a lo uh, there is a, uh, already a huge effort in order to uh, use the uh, strengths of both organizations regarding uh, the mobility and how we prepare logistics, reception, staging, onward movements of troops. And especially the uh, European Union uh, has a strong role to play uh, regarding the mobility uh, in, the, in the skies uh, with the uh, CESAR project, but, uh, but uh, in the cross border on the ground as well. Uh, interoperability, uh, NATO is playing a huge role in uh, developing interoperability uh, 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 capacities and uh, EU is always invited and uh, we cannot imagine that we will develop uh, tools for uh, operability, operability that are different in the two, uh, two organisations. Uh, the same for the development of the capabilities and I'm working uh, quite well with the European Defence Agency in order to at least coordinate the output, which is the key word for that, and, and finally how we train our leaders uh, whether they are stakeholders or the military leaders, in order to propose the complexity of the century I talked about, is another thing that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, necessitates a huge cooperation between, between uh, the power two organizations. And again, the power here is, uh, is, is in, in, European Union, in the uh, European nations. And that's, uh, that's uh, really important for me uh, uh, to mention uh, all, all these events. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you very much, General. Just before we move on, can I just ask you one very short question? How many European nations have deployable headquarters capabilities now? Uh, we have in France, okay, Germany. At least, uh, at, at least five, at least five. Uh, but, but, but more, more than that, in fact. And then a second small thing. Are you saying in your division of responsibilities between collective defense, Article 5, um, are you saying the old, uh, what we learnt in the 1990s, you know, unless we're out of area, we're out of business, we need to forget all that now. NATO is back in area, uh, and that's it. Uh, uh, NATO is, is uh, NATO may have focused too much on the expeditionary operation in the past before the Ukraine, and this is why we are really refocusing really on collective defense. This is not, again, the only core task, but uh, in the other core task, it could be NATO in support, for instance. Okay. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's, that's why I, I was talking about this opportunity to uh, ensure better complementary activity in the two organizations. Okay. I'm going to turn next, if I may, to Arnaud uh, Domachon. Uh, and I just wanted to, to ask you, Rick, who's a member of the European Parliament with deep experience in the uh, intelligence communities. Um, I wanted to ask you just, first of all, does that division of responsibility between the European Union and NATO, is that one that 
uh, you, you would feel comfortable with? Definitely, yes. And I think uh, actually there is no real question. Uh, looking both at the treaties, the European Union treaty recognizes uh, the private essential of, of uh, NATO for collective defense, and at the mentalities where we stand now. This is a reality. Uh, no one is uh, challenging the fact that NATO uh, is really the pillar for collective defense in Europe. Uh, the question, though, is, um, and when we talk about strategic autonomy for Europe, when we talk about a kind of a strategic awakening of the Europeans, uh, more of a, an active role for Europe, it's about the crisis management for the security around Europe, in our vicinity. It's uh, full of challenges, security <coughs> challenges. Can we address them autonomously? Uh, can we address them as European? Uh, and this is uh, the, the real issue now. And on this, I must say that I still have my doubts. Uh, whereas I do recognize that we have made a lot of efforts, that there is probably a new momentum uh, for the last two years, I remain quite skeptical about the sustainability and the fact that it could be reversible. Uh, and I have two points on this. The first one is that as it was mentioned by yourself, but also by Shapiro before. Um, if it was for strategic consideration, the awakening of the Europeans should have happened much earlier. Arab Spring, Libya war, Syria war, it was back in 2011. Ukraine, it was 2014. Did we at that time undertake anything at the European level to uh, enhance our uh, defense policy, European defense policy? Not really, not really. What did prompt new initiative? Trump's tweet. A single tweet of Trump did more to push the Europeans to be aware that they have to do something by themselves. We had the global strategy in 2016, we had some uh, discussions, but no tangible results, and no political will collectively. And we did more indeed over the last two years than the five, six years before. Even though the threats and the challenges were already there. So sometimes I do feel that many European leaders uh, would like to come back to the business as usual this comfort zone where US are there forever, nothing has really changed, Trump is just something superficial, as you noted, and at some point we will come back to normal. I don't think there is, I think there is a new normal, uh, and we have to adapt to this, and this is strategic. But I'm not sure that it has gone deep into all the leaders, uh, European leaders' mentality. And when you discuss, for example, very technical issues, uh, at the Parliament about the new European Defence Funds, when you talk about the new European initiatives, you can feel that the people still believe with, uh, I would say, some old mindset that, well, yes, indeed, we have to do more somehow, but let's rely on the American first anyway. Um, and I think this makes the whole process reversible and quite fragile at the European level. And I'm a bit concerned by that. The second point is that when you look at the European initiatives that have been taken for the last two years, there are texts, a lot of good texts, by the way, the European strategy and many strategies, many uh, um, yes, uh, uh, texts that have been drafted and produced with good quality. You have European Defence Fund now being uh, uh, on its way, uh, and it's, uh, it's about capabilities. So we have a lot of discussions about capabilities and money. That's fine. That's big progress. But no one is talking about operations. No one is talking about, I would say, sorry, it's a bit of a blunt expression, but uh, blood money. Uh, we are talking about civilian mission. Uh, even last week, again, in the, in the European circles, it was like uh, there is a broad consensus. We have to strengthen our uh, civilian missions abroad. Yes, indeed. We all, we all acknowledge that military cannot do everything. But they can deliver things. 
Okay. And the Europeans are still not ready. Excuse me for interrupting, yeah. because I just want to ask you one small question then. I mean, do we, could we actually conduct proper military operations? Do we have the heavy lift or the I-Star to actually conduct the operations? We, we never had a full autonomy to do that anyway. And even the most autonomous uh, country like mine, France, is not able to be fully autonomous when it comes to ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance to logistics and so on so it's not about that but i remember that almost 15 years ago we were able france and germany to deploy troops in congo under eu species could we do that again 15 years after i'm not even sure that we could do that again because in brussels and in many european capitals there is still the feeling that uh, when it comes to military it's not an EU matter. We can do that under UN species, and the Germans deployed in Mali under UN species. We can do that under NATO species, of course. But within an EU mission, that's not the, the first uh, reflex you would have. And I think this is something lacking. Once again, I do not say that we have to strengthen military just for the sake of uh, being able to do things military. But we cannot be credible talking about strategic autonomy, talking about a more assertive diplomacy of the EU without having the military tool uh, in good shape. And I don't think we're there yet. Okay. Um, Noah Rockin, uh, who chairs the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee of the Bundestag and has, is a forthright, I think, sometimes uh, speaker and, uh, um, on uh, German foreign and defense policy. I mean, I think that's a precise cue for you in a way, that we have to recognize um, there is a new normal. But when I go to Germany, and as you know, I spent a few months there towards the end of last year, I don't feel any recognition in Germany that there is a new normal. And then I see a new German coalition come out with a defense budget which is stable um, at best, falls in one year. And so I, I see this dissonance between the Chancellor's uh, rhetoric, which says we have to take care of our own affairs now and look after ourselves, and what Germans actually want to do. And you know, it's obviously a democratic choice, but one doesn't get the sense that Germany and this particular government sees defense and providing military capability as a high priority. Is that unfair of me? <laughs> Unfortunately, not really. <laughs> not really unfair. Um, yes, of course, uh, there is a striking contrast between the fundamental shifts all around us, more and more, and the shifts and disruptions coming closer, not only around Europe, but more and more within Europe. And the I would say the intellectual and, and political stagnancy in the political era. It's quite, it's in the political area. It's, it's quite striking that a recent poll said that 90% of German voters are in favor of more European action in foreign and security policy. But only 20% are expecting this to happen. So there is, so there is, perhaps a growing, and this is part of the good news, there is a growing public awareness we have to adapt. Of course, Germany remains in a stable economic and political situation, so it's not an immediately, an immediate, imminent uh, feel of being affected in the country itself, but I think the awareness that we, that we are facing revolutionary shifts in our political architecture and environment, and that something has to be done, is there. It is not there in the government. There is the prevailing, and it's even worse than before, in the second uh, uh, grand coalition, there is a prevailing mentality uh, of stagnation. So this is the very unfortunate situation. It's so unfortunate because I'm convinced, and it's not only me who's convinced of that, that Germany is uh, key 
to developing a European response to these changes uh, and shifts we have. And the development of military European, I would say intergovernmental European capabilities is, an, is a necessary unavoidable, unavoidable part of the development of a European foreign policy. I would perhaps uh, like to make some very brief remarks in order to be more precise. What is it really about what we have to defend? Where are our real shortcomings? In order to, to get a, a more perhaps precise picture of where we have to start and try to instigate debate. So I would say we should start with the reality that the Europeans mostly and mainly are organized politically in the EU and NATO. And this is a remaining reality uh, which, which provides security uh, for Europe. So I would say it's not the territory we are not able to defend. You are asking, can Europe defend itself? I would say we are able to defend, as we are politically organized, in EU and NATO, we are able to defend our territories. From the unconventional threats as well, from my uncontrolled migration from yes, this is Yes, you, you are right. Regarding and um, speaking about the, the traditional perception of uh, protection of the territory, okay. yes. So, th but this is an important point, uh, and this was, I would say, the, the usual traditional purpose for which uh, 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 armies were, were meant to be built up and, and funded. But there are below the security of borders against military uh, attacks from outside. I think there are vital interests which are not sufficiently effectively uh, defended by Europeans. The first interest is our political order in Europe the political peace order, the order of the Paris Accord, the Helsinki final document, and, the, uh, and Europe whole and free, is violated, effectively violated by Russia. So our political order has to be defended and is violated. European stability, the stability of European societies, has been shattered to its foundations, mainly through the refugee crisis. So we are not able to protect our borders in a new global village we are living in. Europe as an idea, as an idea how to, uh, how to design, how to deal, uh, and how to design international relations on the basis of openness and rules is attacked by our most important ally, the United States. Europe as an idea how to build a, 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 an idea of values what are the core values of societies and states? Rule of law, liberal, uh, individual and political liberties is violated from within. So what we have, we have to make clearer the picture of attacks and violations of European interests and values. And if you see that, I think, then you can make strongly, publicly the case that no one single European member state is able to defend these valued, uh, fundamental, vital interests. For that, we need a European policy. Who can do a European policy? My assumption is that some European states and governments have to start to develop European foreign policies. It will not be only on the institutional level, it has to be on the basis of governments. The EU Commission and the High Rep being one government, but it has to include France, Germany, and I would say post-Brexit Britain and others. And to develop a European policy to respond to these changes and challenges, we need a will and instruments and common shared military capability is part of an unavoidable a set of tools and instruments, otherwise we will not have a policy. And I think this is, uh, these arguments have to be poured into the public debate so that people can understand that we have to do something, that we have to spend more on, on this, uh, on, in these areas. 
the public opinion has an increased awareness that there is a necessity to respond to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nati Tochi, uh, you've got the hardest job in a way, trying to, to speak in last, but I just wonder, uh, among other things that you, you might want to address, um, we haven't talked about the new PESCO uh, initiative. Uh, sorry, you're director for the International uh, Affairs Institute and an advisor, I think, to uh, Ms. Mogherini. Um, do you think looking uh, at the various initiatives that we've had, including including PESCO, that the sort of we've got the structures there now, um, and it's a question of filling them, as it were. Thank you, and uh, let me address the question by um, referring back to the actual question of, of the panel, because I think underlying the question of the panel are, in a sense, three questions. Two of those answers are actually fairly simple, and the third which goes directly to, to your point is, is the hardest one. So question number one, can Europe defend itself today without the United States? Easy answer, no, we cannot. Uh, yes, we talk about strategic autonomy, uh, but we talk about strategic autonomy as an ambition, not as a reality that we already have uh, today. Um, question number two, should Europe be able to defend itself? Uh, again, a fairly simple answer to that question, yes, we should. Why should we? Well, because of the world disorder uh, that we're living through and that uh, was, was referred to, particularly when it comes to close to, to home. Uh, but also because I think it's important to bear in mind that the current disorder that we're living through is, in my view, the consequence of a pretty dramatic transformation uh, and shift and diffusion of power at the global level which not only has as a consequence the various eruption of conflicts and crises surrounding us, but also has as a consequence the fact that inevitably our relationship with the United States will have to change, quite apart from uh, Donald Trump. Um, it's a bit, and, and, and that transformation of a relationship, which bluntly put, used to be a relationship of dependence since the end of World War II, has to develop into a, a relationship which is uh, one between equals. Now, it's going to be a rough ride, and I think we should be all very cognizant of this. It's a bit like uh, when your son or daughter grows up, and you no longer have a relationship between an adult and a child, and through adolescence, you kind of go through a rough patch in that relationship, but ultimately, if things uh, work out, <laughs> that's the, the big question, uh, you find a new balance uh, uh, of, indeed, a relationship between two, two adults. So the third question, which is actually the hardest one, is, okay, fine, so if we're not able to do it now, and we should be able to do it uh, pretty soon in, in future, how is it that we can do it? Now, that question, in my view, has uh, a simple part of the answer and then a far more complicated part of the answer. And the simple part is together. We're all too small, we can't do it on our own, and therefore, as Europeans, uh, we can only do it through, the mem through member states, through institutions working together, and I could run you down a sort of long list of wasteful duplications and lack of interoperability and uh, uh, industrial fragmentation and all of these causes which mean that today we're not in the condition to be able to defend ourselves. So how are we going to achieve this togetherness? Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, one could look at it as saying, well, there are two possible routes to this. Uh, one is the institutional, intergovernmental stroke, supranational route. Well, let's uh, describe this as the PESCO route. And the other is the pure intergovernmental route. Uh, and for the sake of argument, given that uh, after this panel we will have uh, the French uh, Defence Minister, let's call this the European Intervention Initiative route. <laughs> um, and, and these two routes have different characteristics. Uh, PESCO is... Uh, a legally binding uh, set of commitments. It is uh, very inclusive, some would say, possibly including myself, a bit too inclusive. Uh, it has started uh, not with huge fireworks, you know, 17 fairly sort of down-to-earth projects which are both of a capability nature, let's take the armored vehicle, uh, as well as of uh, an operation, potentially operational nature, the CROC project, for example, and a crisis response operation capacity or something along those lines, or, or center. Um, and it's, uh, you know, your typical uh, sort of EU product, uh, PESCO. 
Then you have uh, something like the European Intervention Initiative, which is purely intergovernmental, obviously as a consequence far more flexible, uh, allows indeed because of this flexibility to engage uh, states like the United Kingdom uh, on its way out, as well as Denmark, obviously not in the military uh, side of CSDP, uh, and is generally aimed at fostering a European strategic culture. Now, I would argue, and this would be my final point, that actually looking at these two things uh, as in, in a dichotomous way is actually a big mistake. Uh, and it's a big mistake for, I think, three, uh, three reasons. Reason number one, uh, the European Intervention Initiative is a French initiative. Nine other member states have signed on uh, to this initiative, but it is a French-led initiative, as it should be. It started here, uh, and therefore as, as it should be. But I think it's quite clear when we're talking about strategic culture, uh, and indeed there are huge variations in strategic cultures in Europe, that France, let's be very frank about this, lies on one end of the spectrum. Uh, it is nowhere near the middle ground, uh, if you like, necessary for a real Europeanization, if you like, of, of strategic cultures. I think it's fundamental to have France playing a lead role. I have my doubts whether this can be the one initiative that can actually foster a broader uh, and therefore more central uh, European strategic culture. And if you like, the European Defence Initiative is if you've got to do something pretty quickly, um, and you need a coalition of the willing to, to use that phrase to sort of get some, some boots on the ground quite quickly. You couldn't see them complementary in that respect. I mean, I think one could, uh, so in, indeed one can look at PESCO as something far broader, because indeed it has both its capability development side of the story as well as its operational side of the and story. You plug in the and EU. you can plug in, absolutely. I would see something, I mean, to me, the promise of something like the European Intervention Initiative is actually to bring about, eventually, but I think, as I said, this can only happen through an engagement of the institutions, uh, bring about something we don't have, or rather that we have on paper, but it's never been deployed in, in practice, which is rapid response. Uh, so I think, yes, it is aimed at that, but if anything, I would see the success of something like the European Intervention Initiative as what would enable us to say, well, you know, the battle groups, we've tried that, failed, the concept simply doesn't work, huh? yeah. uh, and, but we need it, we need rapid response, uh, and something like the European Intervention Initiative could eventually lead to that. Uh, but it's indeed, as you say, a very specific side to the broader military story. Okay, fine. Well, look, we've had uh, four really excellent uh, expositions. Uh, I'm going to throw it open, and if you could uh, give your name and uh, affiliation and keep your comment or question reasonably brief. We've got, I think, about 15 minutes to... Um, so I'll click two or three and then come back to the panel and then we'll go start again. So the lady there, I saw first in the middle. Sorry, if you allow me, we'll go first because he has a few words to say. He didn't know that was beautiful. Sorry. Scout in the US, which is focused on the future of technology. Um, and in the last year, I've been spending a lot of time thinking and, and interacting with uh, a wide group of actors, both in the United States and abroad, about the issue of computational propaganda. Um, and one thing that I want to just bring up and, and presence here in this conversation is I think it's very important. Um, in a lot of our conversations this morning, we've talked about, you know, can we trust the US as a European entity? Can we, um, can we create a relationship with them? I think the thing that, that we have uh, found in the United States in particular is that this is no longer a conversation and should no longer be a conversation about state versus state. It should be a conversation about specific actors and specifically individuals within specific political groups because those are the people that in the United States uh, you know, it manipulated um, the public 
uh, into supporting specific behaviors in, in the election that they might not have already done. Um, and that's also something that we see taking place across Europe, right? It was a factor in Brexit, it was a factor in the Italian election, um, and it will continue to be a factor moving forward. So the biggest thing, in my experience, is not um, can a state interact with another state in the correct way. Um, that is, a, it's a, definitely a consideration that needs to be taken into account. But can you protect your citizenry and the minds of your people against the interference of international actors. So, thank you. Great. So, the gentleman back there, I still second. Hi, yes. Um, Does this work? Yes. Nick Whitney from the ECFR. I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you by video. I'm not sure, well, I'm sure why that was. The <laughs> compensation is I, I, get to, uh, I get to ask a question with this panel. And my question is um, very much I want to pick up Natalie's strategic autonomy thing. I mean, CIPRI just published the figures for defense expenditure last year. The Russian Federation cut its defense expenditure last year by 20%. The Russians spent 66 billion euros on defense last year. So we in the EU 28 spent three times as much as the Russians. My question is, how is it possible for us to continue to feel intimidated by the Russians? Um, why is it that we collectively cling to this belief that, that without the Americans we're lost? I mean, is this, a, is this a, simply a nuclear issue? Is this a political issue that we just don't trust each other? Is it an institutional issue that we haven't managed to get the spending sorted out? How can, how can we be in this position? I'd love to hear what the panel thinks about that. Very question. Uh, over there. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Taylor, columnist with Politico. Uh, my question is for Norbert Hodgkin. Um, you speak about the German Grand Coalition in a way that fosters some despair, um, as if you weren't yourself a senior member of one of the coalition partners. So let us into a secret. Um, first of all, what are the discussions going on inside the uh, coalition that make it impossible for Germany to step up to the plate on defense. And secondly, what would it take? Where, does Russia have to invade another country in Eastern Europe, or do we have to have, God forbid, the spread of Paris-style terrorism to the streets of Dusseldorf? Or, or what would it take, in your view, for the Germans, who are the only people who have the fiscal space, um, and who have, in some people's view, to use German terminology, sort of been taking advantage of the moral hazard of being defended by the Americans, and even to an extent by the French and the British, um, to, for the Germans to, 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 to awaken and to um, carry their own share of the burden of defense. And now I can take the gentleman, and then we'll get back. Now, Robert Riccioni, European Commission. Well, thank you for the presentation. Extremely interesting. But I found something missing in the diagnosis of the problem. I heard a lot about our will, unwillingness, inability, timidity. But usually you have to know all the obstacles. are. two examples. Migration. How can we control migration uh, effectively and remain human? Propaganda. Russian propaganda and effect impact on elections. How can we control propaganda and maintain freedom of speech? I'm surprised that we're not focusing on these things, that we focus on our psychological inferiority and the ability to get our act together. In that sense, I very much like to have the answer to the next question, too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think, um, to be fair to our panel, they did give some of the answers. One of the purposes of intervention outside of the EU, whether it's military or developmental or whatever, is presumably to produce more stable environments which don't drive people out of those environments and drive them to take terrible risks coming across the Mediterranean or the Aegean. But that's um, um and I just must apologize. It's my blunder entirely, Nick, so I'm I am deeply uh, uh, sorry. But um General Miska, I think you have to go reasonably promptly. So um, I'm going to ask you first, if, if you, when you have to go, just 
uh, you know, sort of go and we would, it wouldn't be regarded as uh, anyone <laughs> whether that you're walking out because I've offended you after you're offending me <laughs> for, for any reason. So, but I, why did you start? Oh, yeah, thank you very much for this question. And uh, I, I think some of the questions are related to uh, Mrs. Tuchy, what you said, and I may uh, be in disagreement with your first statement. When you said that uh, can uh, Europe defend itself, you said no. I'm in disagreement with that because. Uh, the United States. Uh, can, can I can I finish that, please? Mm -hmm. And I'm in disagreement <laughs> with that because uh, when we uh, when we laid out the uh, uh, joint declaration between NATO and EU, we state three three conditions. The first is collective defense is NATO, and the second is no duplication of what is existing today, and the third no European armies. And, uh, and when I say collective defense in NATO, that goes back to what I've said at the beginning, that no one nation, no one organization today has all the keys of success. And the, the value of the, of the, uh, of the Europe, European area is that, that we have two organizations, the European Union and NATO. If we organize correctly, uh, if we have been, uh, organize correctly uh, the, uh, the relationship between these two organizations, Europe can defend itself. But that does not make any sense to think that Europe can defend itself against Russia without the United States. That doesn't make any sense. But, but we have NATO for that. I've been in Asia last year and discussed with many nations, and nations are very focused on the terrorist, uh, grow, uh, uh, the, 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 the terrorist groups that are growing in their nations, and others are very concerned by state actors, China, Russia, North and Korea. And they do not have NATO, and they do, the ASEAN is even not the European Union. So they are missing this organization. In Europe, we have the two organizations together. And that does not make any sense to think that uh, we would defend uh, uh, against Russia without, without the United States. Uh, because, because we have built this, uh, these two organizations together. <coughs> and I think that uh, that goes to another question, and I will finish it, which was we are uh, our defense expenditures. Uh, expenditures, when we look at uh, all the European nations, there are three times what, uh, what Russia is doing. The main problem we have uh, with the, uh, with, in Europe is what? Is what in, uh, in my command today, I'm working with the other strategic commands on, on the strategic considerations that will inform the political guidance uh, that will be issued in 2019. What does that mean? We look at the ends, the ways, and the means. Uh, in NATO, we have the ends. It's defined by the Washington Treaty, it's defined by a, by a strategic concept which is permanently updated, and it's defined by, by a political like guidance that is updated every four years. When I look at the uh, European Intervention Initiative, when I look at the PESCO, these are means, uh, these, uh, these are ways, uh, uh, ways to meet an end. And uh, when we look at the battle groups in Europe, these are means. But, but what, what is missing in the European Union, there are no ends. So the answer to your question is, is ex unless the European Union defines that Russia and, and, and a fight against Russia, a war against Russia, would be part of the end for the European Union, then we could combine our strengths and develop the capabilities. In fact, it would be a huge duplication with what NATO is doing today. And so we have everything in Europe. This is the only place in the world that we have everything, including the coordination between the big organizations to defend against any kind of threats. Providing that we do not consider them in stovepipe, but we associate the strengths of these organizations. Okay, uh, Rock, and there was a rather pointed uh, question from one of my uh, former colleagues at Reuters from many years ago. Uh, yes, a pointed question. First of all, what does it take that Germany live up to its level of responsibility, which is required and necessary and possible? I, I would consider and feel being a cynic. Uh, to, to add to what has already happened. I think it has happened enough and I would not happen and I would not now um, I, I invent uh, uh, other horrors uh, which would make us do more than uh, we are doing currently. So I do not want to answer that question uh, in danger of being uh, cynical on that. Why, uh, why, why I'm so critical and uh, uh, as a member of the CDU and chairing the Foreign Affairs Committee, we have to start the debate. And I, I have been part of that debate for some time. And unfortunately, I have to continue this role. We have seen some progress in the meantime. Perhaps modest progress, but now we have 
seeing the German defense minister calling for higher defense spending and starting a struggle with the German finance minister. This is a difference uh, uh, compared to former years and budget debates. We have seen the chancellor uh, re remembering, reminding the German public that during the Cold War we had a deficit spending of two, of, uh, a deficit defense spending of 2.5 uh, share of GDP. So now we are at 1.24. So the debate in my party is evolving. I, I'm always very reluctant to to make remarks on our coalition partner, the SPD, but the SPD is in a fight for survival as a popular party. And they have, uh, they have identified a, a different, more pacifist, non-spending approach to foreign and security policy uh, as a topic where you can find more applause and more support in the public than the party has. So this is a very complicated topic uh, uh, within the uh, coalition. And a final remark, you have also, I'm, I'm criticizing uh, how we, uh, how that we are insufficient. Yes, I have done it also here on this panel, but you have to take into consideration that, we, that, that Germany has to undergo a shift in mentality. It's only for four years now that we are facing uh, topics and issues like leadership, strategy, responsibility in foreign policy, so we have not been used to that, so we have to catch up and undergo a fundamental shift uh, um, in the public and political mentality. We are doing that, but we have to accelerate a bit. Okay. Well, just two words on the capability to defend ourselves uh, against whom. I mean, everybody seems to have the assumption that uh, Russia is the threat. The only one, the main one, uh, it is not written in any strategies I have seen at the EU level. Russia is a challenge. Is it a threat, a military threat as such, to be tackled by the EU? We are not there yet in terms of doctrines. Uh, we have NATO deterrence, which works. I do think it works. Uh, Georgia and Ukraine it did not happen by chance. It's Georgia and Ukraine. It's not NATO countries. It's not EU countries. We have to take that into consideration. So do we feel weak towards Russia? I don't think so. Even though we have weaknesses, we have gaps, uh, capability-wise, and we have to address that as Europeans. ESR, uh, uh, transportation. Uh, we have gaps, and we have to work on this, and it's precisely what is at stake at the moment with European Defence Fund and PESCO and all the tools we are putting in place. Second point is all the civilian aspects and political aspects. Russia, we have a kind of psychological fear or malaise because uh, Russia is very well exploiting populism uh, within European Union nations. Uh, here in France, you have this in my political spectrum, at the right wing of France, Russia is very popular, has become very popular. Uh, why? Not because they are uh, attractive, uh, not because the Russian model is somehow attractive, but it's because they're using the weaknesses of our systems. And one of the weaknesses is at the EU level. We have not been addressing the right challenges. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I heard Emma with deep sympathy. But we have been saying this four years and years again. And I remember four years ago we were in Rome, and we had the same discussion four years ago in Rome, and the populists were not in the power. And we were like, how can that happen, that populists are rising? Hey guys, wake up. We are elected people. I'm in my constituency. European Union in my, in my constituency is not popular. And it's not more and more popular. Why? Because we don't address the basic problems, social problems people face. I'm a right-wing guy. I'm not a communist telling you it's all about social issues. But we have a social problem because we have a single market that is more and more seen by people from the European Union, by workers, as not fair. So we have a problem there. And populists are growing this way. Migration is another issue. What do we do beyond slogans? Slogans, very... Uh, uh, 
I would say, a general slogan in the West and very uh, a populist slogan in some Eastern countries. These are slogans, but what is the reality? The reality is that between France and Italy there is no common ground for uh, handling this uh, refugee crisis and the resentment in Italy towards France is big, and I can understand that. And France is pro European led, it's a generous country, but on this migration issue we, hasn't, we have no common answers. People feel that. Don't take people for stupid. They feel that. They go to populists, and where does Russia intervene? There. Because they, they do finance these movements, they do give to these movements very uh, um, attractive slogans, and so on. And it has a geopolitical impact after all. And we do feel a bit uh, uneasy with that at the European level. How do we tackle that? And I agree with the lady, by laws, by big systems, uh, it's not enough and it's not working. There we have a big problem. Thank you. Uh now, there's going to be a little bit of a change in the arrangement, so I think this is the last, you, you have the last word because we're then going to take the minister's delay, we're then going to take a quick coffee break, and the minister's going to be here for 3.15, so I'm afraid we're not going to have uh, any more uh, contributions, so Natalie, if you would take the last word. Okay, so let me again come back to the question of this panel. Can Europe defend itself? The question is not, can NATO defend itself? Can the European Union? defend itself, it's can Europe defend itself. It's a geographical definition. The United States is not in Europe, uh, so if we take this question to mean can Europe defend itself on its own, meaning without the United States, then very clearly the answer to that question is a no. Now, is it a necessary question to ask today? Well, indeed, one may say, well, no, because we have NATO. Um, the United States will come and save Europe if need be. That may be the answer today. Who in this room is absolutely dead certain that in 30 years' time that will still be the answer? I certainly would not be. At the very least, I think the, the fact that there is a question mark concerning, not today, not Trump, not, this is not a Trump story, this is a structural story. In 20, 30 years' time, if we have the slightest doubt that the United States is going, are going to come to the rescue of Europe, then surely we should start working on this uh, now. And I think, uh, coming to Nick's question, um, the, 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 the issue, you're absolutely right, it's, it's not a question of capability, it's not a question of even political will as normally understood. I, to me, it really boils down to a psychological question. And this is why I use the analogy of, of the child growing up and it's, you know, his or her relationship with, with the parent. Um, you know, on, on an issue that is completely unrelated, Know, for sort of JC, JCPOA related reasons, I've been having sort of quite a few conversations with Iranians recently. And the amount of times that Iranians come to, to you and say, well, how is it possible? You guys are so rich, you know? Why is it that you can't stand up to the United States? And yeah, they're completely, you know, flabbergasted, not knowing what to do. So to me, it really starts with a psychological issue, which is a European question. It's not for Americans to resolve, it's for us to resolve within, within and amongst ourselves. Okay. Uh, tough subject, brilliant panel, so can we say thank you very much. <laughs>